You may be wondering why we're doing chapter five instead of chapter four next. Well, we're not gonna skip chapter four, but we should be studying histology and lab and looking at tissues. And so I've changed the order of these so that we can stay a little closer together in lecture and lab. Sometimes that's really just not possible, uh, but this is one that I am able to swap and have us be in the same place. And tissues tends to be one of the harder topics for students. And so I wanna give you as much reinforcement as I can. This is why you do have that extra assignment in your folder to go through the histology tutorial. It's very important that you don't just try to rote memorize these different tissues, you need to try to understand them. So you're also going to have a lecture about identifying tissues in lab to watch as well. In more complex organisms, cells are organized into tissues that are cells of similar types and that have the same function. Understanding how these cells behave and how they reproduce can make understanding biology or the physiology of, of biology a little bit easier. Tissues are building blocks for everything in your body and understanding histology also helps you to predict and understand the behavior of organs and how they function. So tissues are similar cells with a common function. And the study of tissues then is called histology. Uh, there are four primary or major types of tissues. We have epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. And we're gonna look at all of those. Uh, so we're gonna have the introduction to tissues in general, and then we're gonna look at epithelial in this presentation. Part two is gonna be connective, and part three is gonna be muscle and nervous tissue. These tissues associate, assemble, and interact in order to form organs that have those specialized functions. We can distinguish them from each other by analyzing the differences in things, and this is very important. Differences in cell size, shapes, how they're organized. So how are cells put together? We tend to not think about the fact that cells have to be organized and grouped together. Uh, they're done so, they're held together by what we call intercellular junctions. Intercellular cellular junctions connect cell membranes in, in closely packed cells. So that's how they're put together. And we have three different types here we're looking at. We have a tight junction that is um, where membranes of adjacent cells basically fuse together and surround the cells kind of like a belt. Close, and that closes this uh, space between them. You can see tight junctions right here, and basically it just wraps around and cinches up like a tight belt. Next we have, uh, well before that, I uh, forgot to say that these also form kind of sheet-like layers in the digestive tract, so that's a good example of those. Desmosomes are kind of almost like spot welds. Uh, they make them uh, a structural unit by planting them together with something kind of like a spot weld, and you can kind of see that right there in that picture. So it makes them a structural unit. Heart and muscle cells are connected by tubular channels that we call gap junctions. <clears throat> this is a type of intercellular junction, and it consists of fused membranes in a tight junction as well. So gap junctions are a little bit more like a tubular channel, which you can kind of see in this picture right there. Epithelial tissues are found all throughout the body. They cover the body surface and organs and line different cavities. These are basically what we think of when we talk about things like our skin, our skin cells. Uh, since they don't have any blood vessels, the nutrients have to diffuse up to the epithelium from the tissues below. <clears throat> So cells uh, readily divide, uh, which helps healing occur rapidly. Skin cells that are found in the stomach and intestines, for instance, are continually being damaged and replaced. So that's very effective to be able to replace them. Other epithelial tissue functions uh, are things like secretion, absorption, and protection. Uh, these are gonna be tightly packed together. They divide readily. And it's also important to remember that these do not have blood vessels, okay? And that's gonna be important when we look at something we're gonna call keratinization. So these are classified by cell shape and the number of cell layers. So you wanna be sure 
that you pay attention to this and learn how to identify these and not just try to rote memorize them because when you do your lab exam, if you just try to rote memorize, they're basically going to all look the same, okay? So you really want to work on this unit. Uh, so the shape, we have three basic shapes. We have squamous, which is a fat, uh, flat, not fat. Uh, squamous is flat, so this, this cell right here actually is a flat cell. And then we have cuboidal, which is uh, roughly kind of square or cube shape, and then columnar, columnar, so cuboidal is going to be like this, and columnar is going to be a little bit more like that. It's going to be taller. And we do have some intermediates, and we will talk about how to tell uh, which one it is if they look really, really close. Um, we also have different layers. We have what we call simple. This right here would be an example of simple because it is one layer of cells. Stratified, you would have several different layers. So this would be one layer, and then there'd be another layer, and it would keep going. You would have several different layers there. So we've already said, but I want to remind you that when we're looking at these tissues, we want to uh, be able to identify them uh, and distinguish them from each other by analyzing the differences in that cell size, shape, and the way they're organized, and then of course also their function. So we're going to have what we call a basement membrane, and you can see that basement membrane is outlined right here. It's on the bottom, so that's kind of why we get basement, so think bottom basement. Uh, so the basement membrane is going to anchor or attach epithelial tissue, which is the skin cells, to the underlying connective tissue. This is really important to keep in mind when you are looking at different slides. And even though we are not in the lab, we will be looking uh, at slides online uh, that you are going to be seeing different types of tissues in the same slide. So you have to learn what you are looking for, okay, and that you are looking at more than one particular type. So if you see this at the top, that is the epithelial. That is a simple because there is only one layer. Squamous because it is flat, epithelial cell. And then there's the basement membrane. And then uh, you'll see in some pictures down here, there will be some connective tissue that looks very different. Okay. The cells are also tightly packed. There isn't space in between them is what that means. There's no space in between those. And do you see any blood vessels? I don't see any blood vessels, okay? So this here on the left are the drawings, and then there on the right, uh, you can see what it would look like, okay? And so you see the squamous cells up here. They're tightly packed, one cell layer. You can see the nucleus in the middle there. They looked kind of like um, fried eggs, <laughs> all right? So those are usually easy to identify, those simple squamous cells. Uh, you, then you can see uh, there's a basement membrane. It's a little hard to see there. And then this is the connective tissue underneath it. All right. And so if you were taking your lab exam on this, um, I could point out and ask you for several of those things. Where is the, what is the nucleus? I might point to the nucleus and say, what is this feature? What type of cell is this? And then I could uh, ask you what, I'm sorry, what type of uh, tissue is this? And I could point to either the squamous cell or the connective tissue, okay? Uh, a lot of times also in labs, you, you are going to identify where you may find it in the body as well. So where would you find simple squamous epithelial tissue? You know, is there, are there any blood vessels in this particular type of tissue? That could be a question as well. Uh, you'll probably more likely with me see that on your lecture exam. So uh, this is going to be, well, We'll address that in a moment. One thing I, I forgot to tell you in the previous slide is to look for that free surface, that open surface that was at the top layer uh, of those cells. And I will go over that in the lab video, but that's one way you know that you are dealing with uh, epithelial. Now that does depend on the type of slide you are looking at. If it is a cross section, you're not necessarily gonna look at that, but we will go over that. So simple squamous, simple, single layer of flat cells. Uh, they are a monolayer of thin cells that are going to fit tightly together. These are going to allow substances to pass through them uh, easily via something like, of course, we talked about diffusion uh, or even filtration. So these are found in areas where that is needed. Okay, remember structure determines function. So 
why would we need to allow and where would we need to uh, have something diffuse easily through like maybe perhaps oxygen or carbon dioxide? Think about that for a moment. Well, you would want to be able to do that in the lungs, right? You want to be able to uh, have oxygen exchange in the alveoli of the lungs. Uh, oxygen come in, carbon dioxide uh, going out. Uh, they also do things like lining blood vessels. Why would we want them to line blood vessels? Uh, well, we want them to line blood vessels because we've got to get that oxygen once it gets in the body uh, to the particular uh, organs and muscles and things that uh, need oxygen in order to do cellular respiration. Uh, they can also line things like lymphatic vessels. Uh, this is going to be very thin because you want it to be easy for something to diffuse through, and it's going to be uh, that's going to make it delicate, and so this can be easily damaged. So now let's look at simple cuboidal, and these are the ones that are, like I said, roughly square shaped. Okay, they're kind of cube shaped, and you you do have to kind of use your imagination sometimes to see. That this is kind of a cube <laughs> okay so simple cuboidal epithelium uh, these are going to be cube shaped, cubed shaped cells in a single layer and of course they're going to have the spherical nuclei and for cuboidal that should be found in the center of the cell whenever you have some uh, cells that are kind of in between in size between the cuboidal and the uh, columnar, you want to look at where the nucleus is because the columnar has the uh, nucleus in different places. The cuboidal is in the center, so you want to look at the placement of the nucleus. If, if it's really hard to tell if it's columnar or cuboidal, remember that. Look at where the nucleus is. So simple cuboidal epithelium lines things like the follicles of the thyroid gland, covers ovaries and lines kidney tubules and ducts of certain glands. Um, in the kidneys, it's going to function in what we call tubular secretion and reabsorption, and it glands, it secretes glandular products. Now, what you're seeing here with the white space is an opening. Uh, and so, like when things line uh, substances like um, blood vessels or glands, whatever product it is that needs to go through there is what's going to be in the white area. So when we look at tissues that line blood vessels, you can actually sometimes see little red blood cells in there. It's really pretty cool when you're able to see that. So now we're looking at simple columnar epithelium. So these are gonna be way more uh, elongated normally than uh, cuboidal, but like I said, there are some intermediates there. Uh, if this is ciliated, meaning if it has cilia on the top, uh, that's gonna extend from the free surface, okay? And you can see here this white area uh, is in between so the free surface could be uh, right up there okay um, and you can have free surface in here as well that means it's open okay uh, so if ciliated they can extend from that seat the the cilia themselves will extend from the free surface of the cell and they're going to move and undulate back and forth and this can aid in things like taking a, a, a follicle an egg cell through the uterine tube into the uterus uh, so these are really pretty neat little cells that actually help things move along. Non-ciliated simple columnar are found in things like the digestive tract, the stomach, and the intestines. Uh, these have a very protective function because these are much thicker than like the simple uh, squamous. Some do have microvilli, which increase surface area, and microvilli is that enfolding like this, okay? So it's a little different than cilia. Cilia are an added part, and this just means here that they are enfolded when you have microvilli. And the purpose of that is to increase sur surface area and help uh, absorption of nutrients and help to secrete more digestive fluids so you get more bang for your buck, all right? Uh, these can also have what we call a goblet cell. And the goblet cells here are these little dark round or maybe oval egg shaped things. And the purpose of a goblet cell is to secrete mucus. And that's very important in the digestive tract is to have that mucus to uh, protect itself. Um, so you'll find it, like I said, in the uterus, stomach, and intestines. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. 
Uh, that sounds complicated and it sounds like a mouthful, but if you'll focus on learning what these terms mean, it will make this so much easier. Pseudo means false, okay, so fake. Uh, so these look like they're stratified, but if you look really closely, they are not. All the cells here are reaching the basement membrane, okay? So if this was uh, actually stratified columnar, you would have multiple nucleus in different cells, okay? So if it's pseudo stratified, you have one cell and it just kind of has the appearance of that. So this is one of the trickier ones. So you have to be very careful. Look and see, do all the cells reach the basement membrane? That is important. These also commonly will have cilia extending from free surfaces. Uh, they also have those goblet cells, those mucus secreting goblet cells and these line passages often in the respiratory system. So this is what actually produces the mucus uh, that traps things like bacteria that try to enter your respiratory system. And then the cilia work to actually sweep and move that mucus out. So this is an important part or component actually of your immune system. Immune system. It's part of what we call the first line of defense. Stratified squamous epithelium is this Type. Remember, stratified means multiple layers, okay? And so you can see you have that fried egg looking tissue over here, but unlike the other picture where you had picture where you had one layer of cells, you have many, many layers of cells here. Uh, again, you want to look for that free surface. You can see a free surface up here, okay? So there's, there's not a tissue there. Uh, this has many, many layers of flat cells. Those that are near the free surface, if you'll notice, those get flatter and flatter and flatter. Look as you are moving up in this picture. Look how flat these are. Let me erase some of that so you can see better. Look how flat these are. They're very flat, but these are not quite as flat looking, okay? Um, those in the deeper layers have a more cuboidal or, or columnar appearance. Um, the epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin, and that is uh, commonly what is going to be where you find stratified squamous epithelium. And the reason those are stratified is older cells are going to be pushed outward towards the top. Remember, there's no blood vessels in epithelial cells. So the further what they move from this connective tissue down here, see this is a layer of connective tissue, you can see that these look a little bit different. The further away they get from that connective tissue, uh, the further they get away from any nutrients. And so they eventually get up here. Well, these are all dead cells, okay? And you know that. You know that your top layer of skin is often dead cells. They harden and die, and that's actually protective in function. And we call that um, keratinization. We call that keratinization, so it's keratinized. And you will often see in some of these slides, um, you'll often see like some long, thick, stringy looking things at the top when it's keratinized, okay? Um, that keratinization protects the underlying tissues from chemicals, UV light, and uh, different microorganisms keep them from entering. So stratifying cuboidal epithelium. Uh, we've got two to three layers here that form uh, the lining of what we call a lumen. This portion in here is the lumen, and that's what I was talking about earlier. It's kind of that open uh, part, and this is going to be surrounding that, that lumen. Um, it's also going to have a few layers there providing a little bit more protection. Uh, the plural form of lumen is lamina. Uh, this is the inside space of a tubular structure, like an artery or intestine. So like I said before, you will find products in there. Uh, if it's a, a salivary gland, you may find salivary amylase in there. If it's the lining, like I said, of a blood vessel, you may find uh, red blood cells in there. So hopefully you're kind of getting the hang of this and understanding what these words mean. Remember, stratified means you have multiple layers, okay? And it's going to be really important that you know how to write the full name when you take your lab exam. You're going to have to write all three of these words. You can't just write stratified columnar. You need to write stratified columnar epithelium. So practice writing and typing these out. Uh, I do give you a, a, a tiny little bit of grace with spelling, but you need to remember that misspelled words can often equal um, errors in, in uh, 
medical error. Sorry, I was having a moment there with my brain. So it's really important that you learn how to spell these appropriately and correctly. And you know, as uh, any of you that are in the nursing field or going into the nursing or any health occupation, you're going to be doing a lot of charting and you're going to need to be able to spell all of these things correctly. So spelling and anatomy is really very, very important. So you need to practice this. Uh, so several layers of cells that are, they're more elongated. So these are columnar, meaning they're the taller ones. Uh, they're near the top and they're more cube shaped near the basement membrane. So they're a little more cube shaped near the basement membrane. And these are found in things like the milurethra and ducts of exocrine uh, glands. Transitional epithelium is really kind of um, a neat type of tissue to me. Um, it's specialized to change in response to tension, tension pressures. So you will find this in areas where it forms things like the lining of the urinary bladder, the ureters, and urethra. So think about this. Why is it you can hold your urine? Because you can have distension. The tissue will actually stretch in order to hold um, that urine due to that tension. So it responds to that. And so its function is going to be to be a little bit more stretchy and allow for some accommodation there. So if the organ is distended, the tissue is gonna stretch and the physical appearance of the cells actually changes. So you can see that in this picture here, how the top looks a little bit different than the bottom. So that's really important. Uh, you want your bladder to be able to stretch because if it doesn't, if it doesn't have that expandable lining, then we're gonna have a lot of problems when we try to hold it. And you know that those in the medical field, nurses are often having to hold their bladder for a really, really long time. So you are gonna to want to um, really appreciate transitional epithelium. Glandular epithelium is a type of epithelium that secretes into ducts that open onto surfaces like skin or into bodily fluids. So they're going to secrete a substance that has a purpose and that needs to go outside of the body or into a fluid, that's glandular epithelium. These are composed of cells that are specialized to secrete those substances, like those goblet cells are specialized to secrete mucus. Uh, these are usually found within uh, columnar or cuboidal epithelium, um, one or more of these from a gland. We have two types, we have endocrine, remember what does endo mean? Endo means in, and then we have exocrine, and what does exo mean? Exo means out or exit, okay? So uh, endocrine glands secrete tissues into that fluid or blood, so inside the body. Exocrine glands secrete into ducts, and then those ducts will often uh, go outside of the body. Um, so we have unicellular uh, exocrine glands, and those have, what does uni mean? Uni means one. So those have a single epithelial cell, uh, like a mucus secreting goblet cell. That's a unicellular exocrine gland. Exocrine gland. Then we have multicellular, multi meaning many. Uh, and so these are many cells and we divide these into two groups, simple and compound. And these are typical of sweat or salivary glands. These have the different types of uh, structural types of exocrine glands okay so you need to be sure that you know these i'm pretty sure you can see this on your test simple gland uh, a simple gland is going to communicate with a duct that does not branch that's important so let's write that down simple no branching it does not branch before it reaches the glandular cells or secretory, secretory part, okay? A compound uh, gland, compound, it branches, it branches, oh, sorry, that's terrible handwriting. <laughs> it branches repeatedly before the secretory part. So that is important. So this top layer here you're looking at, those are all simple, okay? And then we have compound underneath. Uh, these are also classified by, classified by the shapes of the secretory area. So epithelial line tubes are gonna be tubular glands. So they are like little tubes. Uh, if they have a sac-like area, then we call them alveolar. Alveolar, kind of like our alveoli in our lungs. 
So these are the different stru structural types here. We have simple tubular. Uh, that one seems pretty explanatory, self-explanatory there. Uh, is very simple and it looks like a little tube. So this guy here, that's our simple tubular. And then simple branched tubular. So it's very similar, but it has more than one branch. Uh, simple coiled tubular. These all make really great sense. Uh, it coils, so it's simple. It is tube shaped and it forms a coil. And then we have central, simple branched alveolar. Uh, and this is similar to the tubular, except instead of a tube, it has this more rounded shape to it down here. Uh, and then we have the two compound types. So we have the compound tubular, which looks more like a tube, and the compound alveolar, okay? So now we're gonna look at the types of glandular secretions. Uh, glands that release entire cells that are filled with their secretory products are called secretory or secretory glands, however you wanna pronounce that, okay? So these are classified as three different types. We have merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. Um, merocrine glands are going to release products by exocytosis, so leaving the cell. And these are gonna include things like the pancreas or sweat glands, all right? Like the pancreas or sweat glands. You can see this first picture here is merocrine right here. Let's see. Here is your merocrine right here. These are your merocrine glands. Apocrine are going to um, be the type where small portions of their glandular body break off during secretion. So here in this first picture, you've just got this product being secreted. In this one, they actually break off part of themselves, not all of themselves, but part of themselves um, with their product, okay? So apricot is where small portions of their gland body, their glandular body breaks off during secretion. This includes things like mammary glands and seruminous glands. You know what seruminous glands are? You, I'm sure you know what mammary glands are. Those are uh, where we produce milk, breast milk for our babies. Uh, seruminous is a specialized sweat gland. It's in the auditory canal, and that's what actually produces your earwax. Uh, and you can see that in the middle picture there. And next is holocrine, holocrine glands. These holocrine think whole, okay? Uh, apo uh, kind of means part, holocrine means whole. So these release uh, entire cells or the whole cell that disting uh, disintegrate, disintegrates, uh, releases their uh, secretions after it disintegrates, after that entire cell portion uh, comes off. And this is going to be like a sebaceous gland, and that releases a waxy, fatty substance often found in hair follicles. The difference, in, the difference among these, this is important to understand, among merocrine, apricot, and holocrine, secretions are the amount of cytoplasm secreted along with a glandular product. So let's do a little quiz. Quickly answer, how much cytoplasm is recreate, is Sorry, I'm tongue-tied again today. How much cytoplasm is secreted with American merocrine gland? If you said none, you're right. How much product, I'm sorry, how much cytoplasm is secreted with a holocrine, holocrine gland? Okay, it is the whole cell. And so how much is secreted with the apocrine? And that's going to be part, all right? This is a really good summary slide here that's got all the types of epithelium. I would go and make some flashcards. Um, you can print pictures off, but let me tell you, the best way to learn this and what we do in class for extra credit is we make flashcards. And so I would highly recommend uh, that you make some flashcards on the front draw the picture with colored pencils and take your time and draw it as good as you can. Label those different um, parts of these cells, like label the basement membrane, label the nucleus, label the goblet cells, okay? And so you're gonna put that picture on the front with the labels on the back, put the name of the tissue, write it out uh, on, on the other side, 
and then put the function location and description there as well and then you're going to want to keep these okay because uh, we may have a final uh, lab exam I'm deciding that as we speak uh, but either way tissues are tough and you need to start studying them from day one I think that this recording is going to fall maybe in week two so hopefully you're already doing that I will probably mention that in lab so I'm going to remind you you really need to study these on a daily basis you want to use spaced repetition study a little bit repeatedly every day and you'll spend much less time studying I promise so that's the end of part one and I'll see you back for part two